Membranes and Transport Active Transport Mechanisms In this video we'll take a look at the active transport mechanisms for transporting materials across cell membranes. All of these mechanisms require energy. Sometimes a carrier or transport protein pumps a molecule across a membrane against a concentration gradient. This means that it's moving the particles from an area of lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. Active transport helps cells maintain steep ionic gradients across a cell membrane. How does it work? Let's take a look at the sodium potassium pump. The goal of the sodium potassium pump is to create a net positive charge on the outside of the cell. This is used by nerve cells when they are at rest to create electrical potential. It's important to note the relative concentrations on the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. You can see from this graphic that inside the cell there's already a low concentration of sodium and a higher concentration outside. As far as potassium goes, there's a high concentration of potassium on the inside and a low concentration on the outside. In order to create the electrical potential, the cell is going to pump out more sodium ions. In the first step of this, the carrier protein shape allows it to take up sodium ions inside the cell. It can pick up three sodium ions because there's space for them in the shape of that carrier protein. Phosphorylation occurs and ATP is split and the phosphate group is transferred to the protein and this powers a conformational or shape change in the protein. The result of the shape change is that the sodium is actually released on the outside of the cell and the new shape allows the carrier to pick up potassium ions. When the phosphate group is released from the carrier, the protein reverts back to its original shape and it releases the potassium ions inside of the cell. So three sodium ions exit the cell and two potassium ions re-enter the cell. And you can see that three positive ions have left and two have returned back in. And if the goal of this whole process is to make the outside of the cell more positive, that definitely achieves the goal. But you might be asking yourself, why bother to bring the potassium back in again if that's just going to make the outside a little bit less positive. In fact, the outside has only become more positive by a factor of one since two positive ions are returned back inside. Well, the reason is that these carriers get used over and over again and one carrier might actually take quite a few loads. One carrier protein would actually transport many loads of sodium outside of the cell and in order to do so it needs to be able to return back to its original shape. By bringing the potassium back in, that causes the conformational shape of the carrier protein so that it can again pick up more sodium. So it's a way that this molecule resets itself. Some of the reasons for transporting sodium across a membrane using the sodium potassium pump are to help drive ATP synthesis in mitochondria, uh, create a mechanism for nerve impulse electrical transmission, and this sort of a pump is very universal. It's present in plants, bacteria, and fungi as well. Other uses of active transport that we'll look at later in the course include reabsorption of ions and molecules at the kidneys. Exocytosis and endocytosis. Exocytosis and endocytosis are used to transport large molecules such as proteins and polysaccharides. It allows for bulk transport of molecules. In exocytosis, macromolecules are exported from the cell by fused vesicles. This process is used by secretory cells to export products. For example, insulin and the pancreas or other hormones and neurotransmitters from the neuron as well as wastes out of a cell. Endocytosis imports macromolecules into the cell by forming vesicles derived from the plasma membrane. The vesicle forms from a localized region of plasma membrane that sinks inward and pinches off into the cytoplasm. It's used by cells to incorporate extracellular substances. 
Let's take a look at endocytosis first. There are three types of endocytosis. Phagocytosis is nicknamed cell eating, and it's endocytosis of solid particles. Pseudopods form around the particles, and a food vacuole forms. The vacuole fuses with a lysosome, and the lysosome releases hydrolytic enzymes into that vacuole, and it digests the particle. This process is used by our liver cells, white blood cells, and amoeba. The white blood cells would use it to attack invaders and maybe engulf bacteria, and the amoeba would use it to engulf a food particle. Pinocytosis is nicknamed cell drinking, and it's endocytosis of fluid droplets. The cell membrane simply invaginates, there are no pseudopods, and it is basically considered to be non-discriminating because it takes in solutes dissolved in the droplet. So it might get the desired particle, but it might also get the undesired particle along with it. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is considered discriminating. It involves specific receptor proteins in coated pits, and the coated pits bud inward. So what happens is these receptors bond only with the specific molecule that is the desired molecule. It results in uh, far fewer of the undesired molecules inside of the vesicle and it helps to bring in bulk quantities of the desired molecule. So it's more efficient than non-discriminating pinocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis can be used to bring in particles even if they're not in very high concentration outside of the cell. Examples of this Human cells use this method to bring in cholesterol, and then cholesterol cholesterol generally travels through the blood as low-density lipoprotein, and it's these particles that bind with the receptors, so the stars in this uh, image could be cholesterol. Sometimes people inherit hypercholesterolemia, and this results in defective LDL receptor proteins. As a result, the low-density lipoproteins can't enter the cell, and cholesterol accumulates in the blood, causing early fat deposit buildup in the blood vessels, or atherosclerosis. Exocytosis is the reverse of endocytosis. In this case, a vesicle fuses with the cell membrane and releases some sort of a of a chemical. In the example that we're looking at, we see a nerve cell or a neuron releasing a neurotransmitter. And the purpose of this is to transport the electrical impulse across a gap between neurons. And so the vesicle fuses with the the neuron and releases these neurotransmitters and they bind with a channel protein. Uh, when they bind with the channel protein, the channel protein will actually open up and allow sodium to enter into the second neuron. And what this does is it initiates a nerve impulse in the second neuron, which means that the nerve impulse can continue along. We'll look at this more when we look at the nervous system. In this summary model of active transport and passive transport, which arrow represents active transport and which represents passive transport? Yeah. The downward arrow shows passive transport because it requires no energy for the process to occur. On the other hand, if you were to move a ball uphill, you'd require an awful lot of energy and you'd be going against the natural flow of things. This is not unlike active transport where materials are actually transported against a concentration gradient and therefore require a lot of energy in the form of ATP. So that's a summary of the active transport mechanisms. I hope that helped.